Hello, my name is John Small, and I'm a professor at Queen's University. Uh, the title of my talk is Under the Radar. I want to focus on how some small and seemingly innocuous changes over long time frames can really affect our water supplies, often with little scientific, media, or political attention. I work on the environmental and ecological histories of lakes. I look at time scales not just at uh, years or decades, but I look at often centuries and millennia. I can do this because almost every lake has an environmental history. It's like a history book. At the bottom of every lake, sediments are slowly accumulating, day after day, 24 hours a day. It's much like the, the black boxes of airplanes. Slowly, this information accumulates, and we have ways of re re reconstructing that information and using it in a way that's meaningful to other scientists and the public at large. The record is often quite clear. This provides us with an important history book. We can learn from this that history is not just the retelling of the past. It provides context. It tells us where we were, what, we, what went right. It warns us of our failures. The past can encourage us. Civilizations have flourished and collapsed due to changing water supplies. Water can shape history. It can make or break a king. Our ecological footprint, or perhaps more appropriately here, our ecological watermark, has become deeper and more, more obvious with time. But changes often happen very slowly at first, under the radar, unnoticed. But then big, noticeable problems appear, often when it's too late or very difficult to solve the problem, such as dying fish or algal blooms. There are many examples I can give, far too many examples. But I think acid rain and the acidification of our lakes and rivers is one environmental problem that many people are very familiar with. Often when people are asked, when did acid rain start, you hear dates like, was well, it's around the 1980s. Well, that was the decade when it hit the headlines. Uh, that's when people really started noting in large numbers that we had some real serious problems with our lakes and that fish were dying but, and something had to be done. But acid rain started much earlier than the 1980s. We've shown in some areas that it started almost a century ago, or about a century ago, slowly, bit by bit, under the radar. Acid rain, in many ways, is a partial success story. It is still happening in a reduced form. But by and large, we caught that problem just in time, before even more devastating ecological impacts happen. However, although acidity levels may be recovering, Acid, acid rain resulted in all sorts of other problems, but due to that lack of long-term monitoring data, we only ident identified decades later, after the damage was done. One unforeseen issue that was a legacy of acid rain is the slow but steady loss of calcium from some of our waterways, what we've been calling aquatic osteoporosis. No one was studying this problem because no one knew it existed, even though we can show it goes back decades and decades. Slowly as acid rain fell, we started disrupting how calcium, an essential nutrient for all organisms, including people, we know all about osteoporosis, but also essential for all plants and animals, uh, that, and, and it was, we disrupted the cycle of how it was delivered to lakes. Slowly food webs were affected, they were changing, with one result being the proliferation of jelly-clad water fleas, what we've been calling lake jellification, and possibly other symptoms like algal blooms. All under the radar, slowly happening, an unknown and wicked legacy of acid rain. There's so many other many environmental problems I can talk about, things like exotic species, contaminant transport, and of course the biggest problem we face, human-induced climate change. But all these problems have a history, and like a med medical history you give to a doctor, this history is often critical. So, have we learned anything from these examples? Well, obviously, long-term monitoring and research are important. Surely we should be doing more of it. Sadly, I would argue that instead, environmental science is being marginalized. Perhaps precisely because most of these environmental changes are occurring under the radar, dealing with them does not appear to be a political or government priority. Perhaps because the truly negative impacts won't occur within a typical four-year mandate of, a, say, a federal or provincial government, but instead in decades to come. They are easily pushed aside. We are left with the easy and politically expedient policies, short-term financial gain versus long-term environmental pain. Presumably someone else can worry about that environmental repercussion. That's someone else being the next few governments, but more correctly, our children and grandchildren. Financial considerations are often quick and easy excuses to cut environmental programs. However, it is well established that it is best and certainly cheaper to catch these environmental problems early. I want to continue with the acid rain example that I started with. Since we worry so much often about how much things cost, it's legitimate to ask, 
Was the acid rain monitoring program worth it to identify and deal with the problem? Well, researchers did such an analysis in 2005. They asked, what did the U.S. acid rain monitoring program cost in monitoring, in research, and finally in the cost to industry of complying to the new regulations? Well, that was about $3.1 billion a year, you know, a sizable amount of money. But then they calculated the cost of things like health and ecosystem damages if we did not bring in the acid rain regulation. That was estimated at $122 billion a year. Well, that's much bigger than $3.1 billion. In fact, the cost of monitoring was about one-half of a percentage point of compliance cost and less than one-tenth of a percentage point of the estimated health and ecosystem costs. Sounds like monitoring is a bargain. Surely we can learn from history and realize we should be increasing our environmental monitoring and research. But this clearly is not happening. Environmental science is, in my opinion, under a three-pronged attack. First, the federal government continues to cut environmental personnel. And second, the, the government is cutting the infrastructure that supports these personnel. We have all heard the reports of direct and strategic cuts in areas that I would car categorize it scientists producing pesky data that does not align with some industrial priorities of the current government. One especially serious and telling example that is directly related to water was the federal government's closure of the Experimental Lakes Area, or ELA, in northwestern Ontario. The ELA is a world-renowned and unique facility that had been in place since 1968, almost 50 years. It's known internationally for identifying major water quality problems and how to deal with them. It was, quite simply, the most famous lake laboratory in the world. Three years ago, it was shut down by the federal government without even a press release, as far as I could tell, presumably hoping to be under the radar. Well, of course, we hear all about cost-cutting. Cost Everyone has to do their share, the usual verbiage. But how much did ELA actually cost? Well, the numbers I had was about $2 million a year. That's about five cents a Canadian per year or about a nickel. You know, that's the same coin that I hear the federal government's thinking of uh, discontinuing because what can you get for a nickel today? Well, I think most Canadians would be ready to pay five cents a year to have better water quality. Apparently, if spent wisely, you can get quite a lot for a nickel. This had nothing to do with the budget. ELA lakes, ELA lake scientists produced pesky data showing how changes over long time frames can end up being big problems. You close ELA, and you close about a 50-year run of outstanding monitoring data, and you close an avenue for identifying environmental problems that might clash with some sort of government or industrial priorities. So you fire the environmental scientists, you cut the infrastructure that supports the science, and then with scientists you have left, you don't let them speak freely about the environmental work they are doing. A triple whammy. We eliminate the gathering and communication of pesky data. Well, if all this is true then surely the government should be extra vigilant and provide even stronger evidence-based policies and legislation to ensure the environmental security of our waterways. Sadly, in my opinion, this again has not been the case. In many cases, legislation is now introduced in to dilute environmental regulations, sometimes as part of a large omnibus bill with little or no opportunity to debate and revise the wording. We hear Orwe Orwellian double-speak language. Expressions are currently in vogue in political circles, such as phrases like increasing efficiencies and cutting red tape. Well, who wouldn't want to increase efficiencies and cut red tape? But what does that really mean? Often it is weaker environmental assessment process and watering down environmental legislation, allowing development where before it would be stopped, or at least there would have been an attempt at managing the impacts by the barriers imposed by the so-called inefficient assessment process. Yet, under the radar, all these seemingly small and disconnected changes are threatening our future water security. Under the radar, our past mistakes are catching up to us very fast. Time is not on our side. We seem to continually be forgetting that water does not need us. We need water. We seem reluctant to acknowledge that in a democracy, we can make changes if we collectively agree that the environment is a priority. Perhaps we can agree that sometimes you have to throw stones at giants or nothing will change. Or else, slowly under the radar, we will continue to sleepwalk to disaster as time runs out. Thank you. <laughs>